Hello, darlings. Hello, hello. I'm just about ready to go here. Good evening. Good, yeah, good evening. Good whatever you want to call it. It's evening here. May not be where you are. I don't know. Maybe the middle of the night. Maybe yesterday, tomorrow, the distant future where crab-like creatures crawl along a deserted, lonely beach and... I don't know. I'm thinking of the end of War, of, not War of the Worlds, the other H.G. Wells, the Time Machine, um, which I always wondered if that image, where the A.G. the H.G. Wells time traveler character travels to the end of time and finds this beach with these like crab-like things walking along it, and very bleak, and the sun very small, and whatnot. Uh, I always wonder if that informed uh, T.S. Eliot and his. Uh, his line, um, I should have been a pair of ragged claws. Um, anyway, just weird things to wonder about. Um, anyway, but it certainly would have worked out time-wise since Wells was before T.S. Eliot and was certainly very well known and the kind of thing that T.S. Eliot might well have read as a young person, I believe. Um, anyway, hello, I'm Tad. Good to see you. Um, I'm confused, you're confused, everybody's confused. Why? Because we haven't yet gotten used to the new year. It is 2022, um, and uh, I haven't learned to say that properly yet, so I keep wanting to say 2022 or 2022 or... Tw anyway, it's 2022, 2022. Uh, as I said last night when I was doing the first uh, reading of this Sunday's reading, two reading sessions, I said, boy, those of you who are significantly younger than me have no idea of how science fictional being in the year 2022 seems. Um, it, uh, it's damn near Zager and Evans territory, which will give you an idea again of how old I am. Uh, but it's also just strange. It was strange going through 1984. And it was strange going through 2001. Um, but we just keep adding strangeness onto strangeness. And the years just keep getting further and further forward. And I look up now and um, a lot of times on the news at the moment, they're doing these 100 years ago things. And, you know, they're now talking about things that happened in the 1920s as being 100 years from, from now. And, of course, my brain still tells me 100 years in the past was like the Civil War because <laughs> of when I grew up. So, you know, the idea that 100 years in the past now represents the 1920s, which is quite different from the 1860s. Um, yeah, it's something I still haven't gotten used to. But it's true. It's true. And just as we lost the uh, lovely Betty White this year at age 99, um, my grandmother also, the uh, one of my two grandmothers, but the, the second, the one, the one that, that I had longer, um, passed in, uh, in the year 1999, at age 99, um, the year our daughter was born. And, um, you know, she had... She had lived a long life through a lot of crazy things, but her mother, who I also knew, my great-grandmother on my dad's side, had literally been born at the end of the Civil War. So during her lifetime, because she lived into the 1970s, her during her lifetime, we literally went from horse and buggy to landing on the moon. Now, we're going to see changes at least that extreme during our own lifetimes because the nature of science and technological change is a very steeply rising curve. Um, we may not see things that are quite so obvious because, you know, transportation, um, that's what we did in the 20th century. We did transportation. You know, we started the age of cars and airplanes and all that. Unless, of course, in the next you know, a few years or something that we develop teleportation. But certainly in a number of other ways, we are going to see these kind of continuing steep upward curves of technological change, which, as you can imagine, the person who wrote the other land books is very fascinated by things like that. So we live in a swiftly changing world, but I do think back to my great grandmother um, and, you know, a woman that I spent time around in, you know, in my youth and really into my teenage years, 
who had literally seen that change, that we went from a predominantly agrarian society um, still, you know, ju you know, just into the industrial age, you know, really, and um, in that time to the space age. And it's been quite crazy thinking about that stuff lately. Anyway, before I start on other things, what can I bring you up to date on? Um, I said a lot of this stuff last night. So those of you who are masochistic enough to have returned for, for tonight's reading after having been around for last night's, so I hope there aren't too many of you because you surely must have better things to do during a holiday weekend like I have, which is avoiding shaving. Um, so I'm kind of deep into the Christmas holiday hobo beard thing here. Um, although I may trim it a little bit in the next few days just so I don't look quite so much like somebody who's living out of a shopping cart and I mean honestly no no shade to be thrown at people who have that do not have that uh, that option of moving uh, into an actual house because there are a lot of people out there and it's cold cruel weather so good time to donate socks and underwear and stuff like that to your local shelters anyway while I'm thinking about it but anyway um, I've been mostly just working on getting through the holidays, which for me is always kind of a, a bit overwhelming uh, and just in the sense that I already feel most of the time as if I need every second of every day just to get my work done and to be a dad and a husband. Um, but during the holidays, then <laughs> there are all these other things that have to be done as well. But I'm looking back now and the, the roller coaster, we have just come down the last steep part of the roller coaster as far as I'm personally concerned that starts every year around Halloween and then we have a succession of birthdays and Thanksgiving and you know the, the Christmas holidays and Hanukkah and, and all these other things going on and presents and etc and through New Year's although I must confess nobody in our family is real big on New Year's <laughs> we're just kind of like oh is it after 12 Happy New Year and that's kind of it for us but anyway um so uh, it, it, I'm always a bit panicky during the holidays. Um, I'm sure you've noticed that. I'm sure you noticed me complaining about it if you've been following these readings. Um, so I am glad to say that we have now come down the last long roller coaster swoop and uh, we are beginning to level out and very soon now we will be coasting back into the normal year and we will be unloaded from our little cars, our little roller coaster cars and um, we will be into the, uh, the, the doldrums, the longueurs, longueurs, uh, excuse my terrible French there, but the, uh, you know, the doldrums of January and February, which believe me are very welcome. I'm a big doldrum fan. Um, I don't need excitement, I just need to work right now so I can finish the last volume, um, which is, you know, very complicated because everything now that I'm trying to do requires, every possible change requires me rippling out all the things that it affects. And can, so I can't simply consider like, oh, what if I did this? Because I've already basically finished the first three volumes, but they're all, all these things are kind of hanging fire waiting for me to decide. So every time I try to think of a new possibility of something that's going to happen to one of the characters or the plots or the locations, there's this ripple effect that goes out in all directions that makes it very, very difficult to easily say, yes, that'll work, no, that won't work. Um, so really all I want is quiet time, lying low, get this book finished, and then God knows what, maybe go out for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, sky's the limit. It, it, it'd be crazy. So, yeah, just watch for me in March. I'm going to probably leave the house. Not quite that bad. I'm exaggerating. Anyway, um, so anything else I need to say? No, our, our Christmas was good. We had a very quiet Christmas day for the first time, really, I think, ever. Um, even our youngest kid, who is now in early 20s, was not up at 8 o'clock in the morning demanding to open presents. Uh, which really was going on until last year. She she she's just so conditioned. Um, and this year she stayed up with the other young people watching movies until like five in the morning. So it, I didn't even wrap the last of the presents until the next until Christmas Day, because they were all asleep. And uh, and then we had a really nice family get together on Boxing Day. Not immediate family, but my wider family. My 
brothers and sisters-in-law and cousins and not my cousins but the cousins of our kids and that whole group we had a very nice get together on christmas day so um i am feeling uh, it's hard to say, you know these days it's very hard to feel optimistic <laughs> about anything because of course every time we start to feel optimistic like oh the pandemic is is starting to fade you know some horrible new thing comes in and every time we start to feel like oh thank goodness political life is back to normal you know some other horrible thing happens or some crazy psycho representative from somewheresville stands up and says basically democracy is for people like me but not for the rest of you or whatever you know and you like oh my god are we going to go through this all again um but given all of those things that are have a tendency to happen or, and do happen um especially if you make the mistake of reading the news uh, i'm i am now cautiously optimistic i can get back to work on my book my family has remained healthy so far um although obviously we're still concern we have health issues in the family and you know um fortunately everybody in the family we don't we're very lucky that way our family we don't have people that are going well this pandemic stuff is just nonsense and i'm not gonna wear a stupid mat no everybody in my family is like what's so hard about wearing a mask for god's sake let's wear masks you know let's let's not get these horrible diseases let's not have our my parents our you know, the, the patriarch and matriarch of the family who are in their late 80s now. Let's not have them get sick, you know, and maybe die. Um, let's take care of the people in our family who need to be taken care of because we love them and we don't want to lose them. Um, so I'm feeling, you know, at least cautiously optimistic that 2022 so far has a chance of being better than 2021. When 2021 was marginally better than 2020, so, you know, fingers crossed, and uh, I hope we can all go on together into the future, as it were, and do so healthily. Um, anyway, so let me check in with all of the folks who are checking in, and as usual, they're doing confusing things with the comments. Okay, that, no, that doesn't do it. I don't want that. What does that do? Uh, module comment. Oh, God, these people. Okay, so everything seems to be backward as, you know, usually there's always something weird. So let me just say hello to everybody. So there's Pierre. Happy New Year, Pierre. Lovely to see you. Great pleasure as always. Mahmoud, a pleasure to see you too, sir, as always. Um, as far as me growing along, beard, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't like having a beard, actually. My skin gets all weird um it and itchy and i have you know they say that that they're like some people's beards are like copper wire well i'm one of those people i have very heavy beard and just sleeping on it at night not that anybody cares about this but just that's the reason i'm not in a big hurry to read to uh you know like grow a long beard anyway okay who else is here nancy happy new year we did we had a lovely holiday i hope you had a good one too Jared, Happy New Year to you too. I hope this year brings an absurd amount of joy to all of us. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be a nice change of pace? That would be so grand. Rhonda, hello to you too and Happy New Year. Wouter, quick good night. I completely understand since you're way on the other side of the ocean. Um, and well, actually on the other side of the country for me and then over the ocean since I'm on the Pacific Rim side. Calvin, hello, happy new year to you too. The rest, the holidays were actually fairly restful. So excellent, excellent. Thank you for, for the good wishes. Krista, happy new year to you too. Jerry, Mr. Unangst. Yeah, I know, soil and green. Hey, okay, honest to goodness, that's the one thing I'm not worried about yet that we're gonna start eating each other. Not yet, check in with me. New Year's Day 2023, and I'll tell you how I feel about it. But anyway, Jerry, good to see you. Happy New Year's, bud. Brenna, I know Star Wars is a 45-year-old movie. I, you do not have to tell me. I, I, It's fascinating being old, but it's not necessarily always comfortable. And who else have we got here? Chris. Hello, Chris. Happy New Year to you. Emily, <laughs> Star Wars old, <laughs> that is good. Emily says she impresses kids by telling them she's Star Wars old. I like that. Uh, yes, and Chris, hello, hello, hello. I think I already said hello to you. Yes, same Chris. Okay, good. Chris Vandal, lovely to see you. 
Um, 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 who else we got? Rose. Hello, Rose. I'm glad you're here too. And Melissa, you made it also. Hello, hello. And Jeremy, Happy New Year. And to you and your family on the other side of one of our invented corners in time. I know. It's weird, isn't it? Uh, my bum bum. And I think I already said hello to everybody there. John, good evening to you. Ray, greetings and Happy New Year to you. Yes, and I know about the Otherland game. And as I think I said in a reply to you elsewhere, we have hopes for the future. So don't despair quite yet. Uh, well, not... I mean, yes, that 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 game is is sadly does seem to be shut down. Um, but I, I'm saying you never know what's going to happen, and uh, you never know. Um, it's also one of the reasons I never count on anything because, in just the same way that one can say, "Hey, you never know what could happen," in a positive sense, I think the last two years have taught us never discount the negative possibilities. Hey, you never know. You know, there could be a worldwide pandemic that would screw everybody's careers and life and family and all that stuff up big time. Uh, I doubt many people were saying that in 2019. Uh, I think a lot of people learned that lesson. You, you can go both ways with these unexpected things. So anyway, so I am going to continue reading. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you for putting up with me while I babbled, but it's of course the first time I've seen you guys for a couple of weeks. Continuing to read from Otherland, City of Golden Shadow, although I will just hold this up long enough to once again emphasize how beautifully designed these books are and how lovely Michael Whalen's painting. I don't know if I told you guys this, but I actually, the, the, I was at Michael's house. Um, he and Audrey had, or were kind enough to, to have us over for the day. And I saw the painting um, for this. I think he was working on one of the later paintings at that point, but he might have been working for this one. Anyway, I saw the painting. The painting is only barely bigger than this reproduction of it. You know, I mean, the painting itself is probably only like this wide and not even quite that tall. So it was really startling to me how, how small Michael was working on that picture. Um, and especially when you look at it closely, the detail work is just gorgeous. Anyway, I, I still think, I've said this before, I still think this is some of the very best work um, in a career of wonderful work. I think this is some of the best work Michael Whalen ever did. And um, I love the other land covers. They're immensely gorgeous. So, all right, here we are. So the last thing that we were reading last night, we had gone through two other sections. Um, we had Orlando we discovered a little bit more about Orlando, namely that there's, uh, most of you have read the books maybe, but uh, so I'm, I'm praising or I'm synaps, synopsizing these. <laughs> I'm synapsizing a collapse. I'm synopsizing these for people who may not know the story too well and are taking it as it comes. So we found out that Orlando appears to have health problems um, and that he is absolutely obsessed with this golden city that he saw um, while he was in the middle of one of his online adventures, which is what he does. Um, and the implication is that he does a lot of this because he's not physically very healthy. Then we saw Christabel get a sudden and surprising summons from Mr. Sellers, who you may remember is the very strange disabled man who lives in a little house on the army base and has befriended Christabel, who's about seven, whose father is uh, one of the main security guys on the base. And um, he had her bring him some soap because he was very ill. And he then ate the soap. Um, and that is as of yet unexplained. And then we went back to the Rini and Kabu storyline, which is the, the two of them in Mr. J's. And Rini has been trying to find Kabu, and she has just flicked through a huge amount of of settings or rooms or whatever you want to call them within Mr. J's, um, trying to trying to get separated from Strombello, the rather ominous fat man who is chasing her, um, but she still doesn't know where Kabu is. So here's the last one. There's a whole. I just I read a whole list of all the different places that she's popped from, from one to another, from another, just randomizing her trip through to try and lose the people who are tailing her in this virtual nightclub. Anyway, dizzy, almost ill from the speed of her transitions, Rini paused on the terrace. She closed her eyes until the blur of colors stopped, then opened them again. 
A few of the dozen or so guests sitting at tables along the edge of the garden looked up incuriously, then turned back to their conversations and the spectacle of the waterfall. May I serve you? A smiling elderly Asian man had materialized beside her. I'm having trouble with my pad, she told him. Can you connect me to your main switching center? Done. Would you like a table while you conduct your business, Mr. Otepi? Damn. She had stopped in one of the high rent zones of the club. Of course they would have run her index as soon as she entered. At least they hadn't grabbed her. Maybe Strimbello hadn't put out a general alert. Still, there was no sense pushing her luck. Not yet. Thank you. I may have to leave. Just a privacy shield, please. The man nodded and then vanished. A circle of blue light appeared around her at waist level, demonstrating that she was shielded. She could still hear the roar of the great waterfall and watch it smashing down the rocks into the canyon, where it disappeared into a cloud of white spume. She could even see the other guests and hear the occasional snatch of conversation over the water noises, but they, presumably, could no longer see or hear her. No time to waste. She forced herself to think calmly. She dared not leave unless Kabu had already gone offline, but if he had, she would have no way of knowing. If she stayed, she felt sure Strombella would find her, sooner rather than later. He might not have sounded a general alarm. Even as an intruder, she was probably not very important in the larger scheme of things. But Strombello himself, whether human or frighteningly realistic puppet, did not seem the type to give up easily. She would have to find a way to stay inside the system until she either located Kabu or was forced to give up. Phone connect. A gray square appeared before her as though someone had taken a sharp knife to reality, rather to imitation reality. She gave the number she wanted, then keyed in her pad's identification code. The square remained gray, but a small glowing dot appeared in the lower corner to tell her she'd connected with the one-shot access bank she'd prepared for just such an emergency. Carnival, she whispered but it was only reflex. If the privacy shield was legitimate, she could scream the code word until her lungs ached without anyone hearing. If it wasn't, everything she had done was already known to her pursuers. Nobody seemed to be watching. The access bank downloaded the new identity instantly. She was faintly disappointed that there was no sensation. Surely shape-changing a hallowed and ancient magical art should feel like something. But, of course, her shape hadn't changed. She still wore the same nondescript sim in which she'd entered, and behind that was still Irene Sulawayo, teacher and part-time net bandit. Only her index was different. Mr. Otepi, from Nigeria, had vanished. Mr. Babutu, from Uganda, had taken his place. She dissolved the privacy shield and surveyed the massive waterfall, the elegant formal garden. Waiters or things that looked like waiters, were skimming from table to table like water bugs. She couldn't hang about this place forever. In such a service-intensive sector of the club, she would quickly attract attention again, and she did not want her new identity linked in any way with the old one. Someone would notice, eventually, of course. She had entered as Otepi, and at the end of some arbitrary accounting period, an expert system checking the records would notice that Otepi had never left. But that might be hours from now, or even days. A node with a turnover as large and constant as Mr. J's would have a hard time locating the other half of the discrepancy, and with luck she would be long gone by the time they did. With luck. With a word, she shifted back to the main lounge, where she would pass unnoticed more, uh, more easily in the large and active crowd. She was tired, too, and eager for the chance to stay in one place for a few minutes. But what about Kabu? He was so much less experienced. What effect would such stress be having on him if he wandered somewhere in this vast labyrinth, alone and frightened? The lounge was still full of glaring lights and long shadows, of voices and wild music. 
Rini picked a bench sunk in the darkness at the base of one of the cyclopean walls and turned down the gain on her earplugs. It was hard to know where to start. There were so many rooms here, so many public spaces. She herself had been in dozens, and she was sure she had only scratched the surface, and she could not even guess at how many people might be in the club. Hundreds of thousands, perhaps. Mr. J's was not a physical space. The only limitation was the speed and the power of the equipment that lay behind it. Her friend could be anywhere. Rini turned to look at the revolving stage. The pale singer and her goblinish band were gone. Instead, a group of elephants, normal in every detail, except for their straw hat, sunglasses, and strangely spiky instruments, and, of course, the delicate rosy pink of their baggy skins, were churning out slow, thumping dance music. She could feel the jar of the bass even through her lowered earplugs. Excuse me? One of the shiny-faced waiters hovered before her. Nothing but rent for me, she told him. I'm just resting. Fine with me, I assure you, but I have a message for you. For me? She leaned forward, staring. She felt her skin tingle. That's not possible. He raised an eyebrow. His foot tapped on air. Rini swallowed. I, I mean, are you sure? If the waiter was playing a game with her on behalf of her pursuers, he was doing a very convincing job. He practically seethed with impatience. Oh, sweeze, you are Mr. Babutu, aren't you? Because if you are, the rest of your party wants to meet you in the contemplation hall. She recovered herself and thanked him. An instant later, he was gone, a vanishing huff of silver. Of course, it could be Kabu, she thought. She had told him the name of both emergency identities, his and hers. Then again, it might just as easily be Strimbella or some other less broadly drawn functionaries wishing to avoid a scene. Kabu or Strimbello, it had to be one or the other. Mr. Babutu didn't really exist, so no one else would be looking for him. What choice did she have? She couldn't ignore the possibility of finding her friend. She picked Contemplation Hall out of the main menu and shifted. She thought she detected an almost infinitesimal hitch to the transfer, as though the system were experiencing unusually heavy usage. But it was hard to dispel the idea that the delay might mean she was going somewhere deep into the heart of the system, far from the metaphorical surface, deep inside the beast. The hall was a very striking conception, a sort of classical folly writ large. Tall columns covered in flowering vines held up a huge circular dome, part of which had cracked and fallen away. White shards, some as large as a suburban house, glinted like bones along the base of the columns, tucked in threadbare blankets of moss. A bright blue sky, striped with wind-tattered clouds, showed through the hole in the dome and between the pillared arches on each side, as though the hall stood atop Mount Olympus itself. A few sims, most of them far in the simulated distance, strolled about the wide, grassy space inside the ring of stone. She did not like the idea of leaving the outer edge and moving into the open space, but if the club's authorities had summoned her to this place, it wouldn't matter whether she tried to be inconspicuous or not. She shifted toward the center and turned to gaze around her, impressed with the completeness of the design. The stones of the massive folly seemed convincingly old, surfaces shot with cracks, columns surrounded and overgrown with vegetation. Rabbits and other small animals moved across the hummocky ground, and a pair of twittering birds were building a nest on one of the shards of the tumbled dome. Mr. Babutu? She whirled. Who are you? He was a tall, lantern-jawed man, made to seem even bigger by his baggy, dark suit. He wore a tall and scuffed black top hat. A striped muffler hung loosely around his long neck. I'm wicked, he smiled broadly, tipping the hat. The shabbiness of his attire sat oddly with his quick, vigorous movements. Your friend, Mr. Wande, sent me. 
You got a message from him? Rini eyed him. Where is he? With some of my mates. Come on, I'll take you to him. He pulled something from inside his coat. If he saw Rini flinch at the movement, he showed no sign, but instead lifted the battered flute to his lips and played a few piping bars, something that she could not identify, but which seemed familiar as a nursery rhyme. A hole opened in the grass between them. Rini could see steps leading down. Why didn't he come himself? Wicket was already in the hole to his waist, which left the top of his black stovepipe at about Rini's eye level. Not feeling well, I think. He just asked me to fetch you. Said you might ask some questions and to remind you about some game with string. The string game. Kabu's song. Rini felt a weight of worry lift from her. No one but the Bushman could know about that. Wicket's hat was just vanishing below the surface of the ground. She climbed down after him. The tunnel seemed to be something from a children's book, the home of some talking animal or other magical creature. Although within moments she and Wicket had moved far below what should have been the surface, the tunnel wall was pierced with small windows, and out of each she could see a scene of artificial beauty. Riverlands, meadows, wind-groomed forests of oak and beech. Here and there along the downward spiral of the steps were small doors no higher than Rini's knee, each with a knocker and minute keyhole. The urge to open one was powerful. The place was like some wonderful dollhouse. But she could not pause to look at anything. Although she herself was forced to keep one hand on the curving banister, Wicket, despite his long legs and broad shoulders, bounced down the stairway ahead of her at a rapid pace, still blowing on his flute. After a few minutes he had vanished down the twisting stairwell, only thin, musical echoes proved he was still in front of her. The stairwell wound down and down. Occasionally she thought she heard high-pitched voices from behind the doorways or caught a glimpse of a bright eye peering out through a keyhole. Once she had to duck to avoid garroting herself on a laundry line which had been stretched right across the stairwell. Tiny calico dresses, none bigger than a slice of bread, Slamped, dap, slapped damply against her face. Slapped damply against her face. Down they went, still farther. More stairs, more doors, and the continuous trill of Wicket's elusive music. Rini felt the char fairy tale charm of the place beginning to pall. She craved a cigarette and a glass of beer. She ducked her head again to go under a low spot in the stairwell, and when she raised it, the light had changed. Before she could react, her foot met resistance too suddenly, giving her a jolt that would have been painful if her body were not in harness back at the poly. She had reached level ground. Stretching before her, as if in continuation of the storybook theme, was a mystery cave, the sort of place which jolly children discovered in jolly stories. It was long and low, all stone and soft earth. The ceiling was whiskery with roots as though the cavern were some hollow space beneath forest earth, but tiny lights twinkled amid the tangle. The dirt floor was covered with piles of strange objects. Some, feathers and shiny beads and polished stones, looked as though they had been collected and abandoned by animals or birds. Others, like a pit filled with the limbs and heads of dolls, seemed purposeful and somewhat overwrought a university art project on corrupted innocence. Other objects were just as incomprehensible, featureless spheres and cubes and less recognizable geometric shapes scattered across the earthen floor. Some of these even seemed to glow with a faint light of their own. Wicket stood grinning before her. Even with his shoulders hunched, the top of his head loomed up among the twinkling fairy lights. He lifted his flute and played again, doing a slow dance as he did so. There was something incongruous about him, some oddness that Rini couldn't quite name. If he was a puppet, he was a work of real originality. Wicket stopped and repocketed the flute. You're slow, he said, mockery in his deep voice. Come on, your friend's waiting. 
He swept one hand to the side in a mock formal bow and stepped back. Behind him, on the far side of the long cavern, blocked from her sight until this moment, was the occluded glow of a campfire, fenced by shadowy figures. Rini, again feeling the need for caution, moved forward. Her heart sped. Kabu, or a sim that looked very much like his, was sitting in the midst of a group of much better defined figures, all men in tattered finery similar to wickets. With his sketchy features and rudimentary body details, the Bushman seemed like nothing so much as a gingerbread man. More fairy tales. Rini was feeling a little punchy. Are you okay? She asked on a private band. Kabu, is that you? There was no reply, and for a moment she was certain she'd been tricked. Then the sim turned toward her, and a voice that, despite the distortion, was recognizably the Bushman said, I am very glad my new friends have found you. I have been here such a long time. I was beginning to think you had left me behind. Talk to me, Rini said on the private channel. If you can hear me, just raise your hand. The sim did not move, but sat regarding her with expressionless eyes. I wouldn't leave you, she said at last. How did you end up here? We found him wandering around, lost and confused. Wicket drew up his long legs as he seated himself beside the fire. My friends and me. He pointed to the others in the circle. That's brown bread, whistler, and corduroy. His companions were fat, thin, and thinner still. None were as tall as Wicket, but all seemed otherwise quite similar, full of nudges and restless energy. Thank you. Rini turned her attention back to Kabu. We must be going now. We're really quite late. Are you sure you wouldn't rather stay with us for a while? Wicket spread his hands before the flames. We don't get many visitors. I would like to. I'm very grateful for your help, but we are running up too much connect time. Wicket raised his eyebrow as though she had said something faintly off color, but remained silent. Rini leaned forward and put her hand on Kabu's shoulder, conscious that back at the poly she must be touching his real body. Despite the low quality of the force feedback, it certainly felt like her friend's narrow, bird-like physique. Come along. Let's go back. I do not know how. There was only a little sadness in his voice, but a great lassitude as though he spoke from the edge of sleep. I have forgotten. Rini cursed to herself and triggered the exit sequence for both of them. But as the cavern around her began to blur and fade, she could see that Kabu was not shifting with her. She aborted the exit. Something's wrong she said. Something is holding him here. Perhaps you'll have to stay a little longer. Wicket smiled. That'd be nice. Mr. One Day can tell us some more stories, said Brown Bread, pleasure evident on his round face. I wouldn't mind hearing the one about the lynx and the morning star again. Mr. One Day can't tell you any more stories, Rini said sharply. Were these men simple-minded, or were they just puppets, enacting some strange looped tableau that she and Kabu had stumbled into? Mr. Wande has to leave. Our time is up. We cannot afford to stay longer. Greyhound-thin corduroy nodded his head gravely. Then you must call the masters. The masters see to all comings and goings. They will put you right. Rini felt sure she knew who the masters were, and knew she did not want to explain her problem to the club's authorities. We can't. There, there are reasons. The men around the fire frowned. If they were puppets, they might at any moment trigger some automatic message of breakdown to the club's troubleshooters. She needed time to figure out why Kabu could not be removed from the net. Uh, there is... There is someone very bad pretending to be one of the masters. If the masters are summoned, 
then this bad one will find us. We cannot call them. All the men nodded now, like superstitious savages in some Z-grade Netflix. We'll help you then, said Wicked enthusiastically. We'll help you against the bad one. He turned to his companions. The Colleen! The Colleen will know what to do for these fellows. That's right! Whistler's lisp betrayed the origin of his name. He spoke slowly and wore a lopsided grin. Still help, but still want something. Who's Colleen? Rini struggled with fear and impatience. Something was seriously wrong with her friend. The club authorities were searching for her, and Strimbello had said he knew who she really was, but instead of taking Kabu and getting the hell out, she was being forced to participate in some kind of fairy tale scenario. She looked at the bushman. His sim sat motionless beside the fire, rigid as a chrysalis. She knows things, said Brownbread. Sometimes she tells. She's magical. Wicket waved his long hands as if to demonstrate. She does favors for a price. Rini could not help herself. Who are you? What do you do here? How did you get here? Those are some very, very good questions, Corduroy said slowly. He seemed to be the thoughtful one. We'd have to give a lot of gifts to the Colleen to get the answers to all those. You mean you don't know who you are or how you got here? We have ideas, Corduroy said meaningfully, but we're not sure. We argue about it some nights. Corduroy is the best arguer, Wicked explained mainly because everyone else gets tired and quits. They had to be puppets, these men, but they seemed somehow lost, remote from the rest of the club's bright glare and knowing blandishments. Rini felt a chill at the idea of constructs, bits of coated gear sitting around a virtual campfire and arguing about metaphysics. It seemed so lonely. She looked up at the glittering light snarled in the tangle of roots above, like stars, little flames to ameliorate the darkness above as a campfire stands sentinel against the darkness of earth. Okay, she said at last, take us to this colleen. Wicket reached down and plucked one of the burning brands from the fire. His three friends did the same, their faces suddenly full of solemnity. Rini couldn't help feeling that in some strange way this was all a game to them. She reached for the final piece of wood, but Corduroy waved his hand. No, he said, we always have to leave the fire burning so we can find our way back. Rini helped Kabu to his feet. He swayed slightly as though almost fainting with weariness, but stood by himself when she took her hand away and turned to the men. You said we'd have to take a, a gift. I don't have anything. Then you must give her a story. Your friend Mr. Wande knows lots. He told us some. Brownbread smiled, remembering. Good stories they were. Wicket took the lead, bending his neck to keep his head below the trailing roots. Whistler came last, holding his torch high so that Rini and Kabu were surrounded by light. As they walked, Rini experienced a faint blurring along the edges of her vision. She could never see it happening directly, but the place around them was changing. The feathery roots overhead became thicker, and the tiny lights dimmed. The soft, loamy earth beneath their feet hardened. Before long, Rini realized that they were walking through a succession of caves with only the torches for light. Strange shapes covered the cavern walls, drawings that might have been done in charcoal and blood, primitive representations of animals and people. They seemed to be moving downward. Rini reached out to Kabu, wanting mostly to be reassured of his presence. She was beginning to feel almost as much a part of this place as Wicked and the others. What section of the club was this? 
What was its purpose? Kabu, can you hear me? There was still no response on private band. How are you feeling? Are you okay? He was a long time answering. I... I am having trouble hearing you. There are other presences, very close. What do you mean, other presences? It is hard to say. His voice was listless. I think the people of the early race are near. Or perhaps it is the hungry one, the one burned by the fire. What does that mean? She tugged at his shoulder, trying to break through his odd lethargy, but he merely tipped a little to one side and almost stumbled. What is wrong with you? Kabu did not answer. For the first time since she had found him, Rini began to feel truly frightened. Wicked had stopped before a large, natural archway. A chain of crudely sketched eyes surrounded it, dark as bruises against the torch-lit stone. We must go quietly he whispered, lifting a long finger to his lips. The Colleen hates clatter. He led them under the arch. The cavern beyond was not as dark as the corridor outside. At the far end, scarlet light glared from a crevice in the floor, staining the rising steam. Barely visible through the red-shot mist was someone seated on a tall stone chair, still as a statue. The figure did not move, but a voice filled the cavern, cavern, a throbbing, growling sound, which, despite the clearly understandable words, sounded more like a church organ than human speech. Come forward! Rini flinched, but Wicket took her arm and led her toward the crevice. The others helped Kabu over the rough ground. It's the, what's it called, the Delphic Oracle? Rini thought. Someone's been studying Greek mythology. The shape on the stone chair stood, spreading its cloak like the wings of a bat. It was hard to tell through the rough garment and obscuring steam, but it seemed to have too many arms. What do you seek? The tolling voice came from everywhere at once. Rini had to admit the whole thing was impressively eerie. The question was, would going through this charade actually help? They want to leave, said Wicket, but they can't. There was a long moment of silence. You four must go. My business is now with them. Rini turned to thank Wicket and his friends, but they were already hurrying back toward the cavern's entrance, jostling each other in their haste, like a gang of kids who had just lit the fuse of a firecracker. She suddenly understood what had puzzled her about Wicket since the first meeting, and about his companions as well. They moved and spoke like children, not like adults. And what do you offer in return for my help? asked the Colleen. Rini turned. Kabu had slumped to the ground before the crevice. She squared her shoulders and made her voice as calm as she could. They told us we could give you a story. The Colleen leaned forward. Her face was veiled and invisible, but the shape beneath her robes, extra arms or no, was recognizably female. A necklace briefly caught the light as large, pale beads glinted against the darkness of her breast. Not just any story. Your story. Tell me who you are, and I will set you free. The word gave Rini a moment's pause. We simply wish to leave, and something is preventing us. I am Wellington Babutu of Kampala, Uganda. Liar! The word clanged down like a heavy iron gate. Tell me the truth! The Colleen lifted hands, clenched into fists. Eight of them. You cannot mock me. I know who you are. I know exactly who you are. Rini stumbled back in sudden panic. 
Strimbello had said that too. Was this all some game of his? She tried to take another step and found she couldn't, nor could she turn away from the crevice. The burning light was suddenly very bright. The red glow and the dark shape of the colleen scratched against it were now almost the only things she could see. You will go nowhere until you tell me your true name. Each word seemed to have a physical weight, a crushing force like a succession of hammer blows. You are in a place you should not be. You know that you have been caught. Everything will go better for you if you do not struggle. The power of the creature's voice and the constant serpentine movement of the arms silhouetted against the glare were strangely compelling. Rini felt an over, almost overwhelming urge to surrender herself, to blurt out the whole story of her deception. Why shouldn't she tell him? Why shouldn't she tell them who she was? They were the criminals, not she. They had harmed her brother, and God knew how many others like him. Why should she keep it secret? Why shouldn't she just scream out everything? The cavern warped around her. The scarlet light seemed to burn at the bottom of a deep hole. No, it's, it's some kind of hypnosis trying to break me down. I have to resist. Resist for Stephen, for Kabu. Tell me, demanded the Colleen. Her sim still wouldn't retreat or turn away. The snake-like arms moved in ever swifter patterns, turning the glare from the crevice into a strobing succession of dark and light. I, I must close my eyes. But she couldn't even do that. Rini struggled to think of something other than, sh than the shape before her, the demanding voice. How could they stop her even from blinking? This was only a simulation. It couldn't physically affect her. It had to be some kind of high-intensity hypnosis. But what did it all mean? Why Colleen? A maiden? A virgin like the Delphic Oracle? Why go to such lengths just to terrify trespassers? It was the kind of thing you did to scare a child. Eight arms. A necklace of skulls. Rini had grown up in Durban, a town with a large Hindu population. She understood now what the thing before her was supposed to be. But people from other places might not understand the oracle's name, especially children. Wicket and his friends had probably never heard of the Hindu death goddess Kali, so they had come up with their own version. Wicket, Corduroy, they weren't adults, she suddenly realized. They were children, or childlike puppets. That was why she had found them so strange. Here, in this horrible place, Children were being used to catch other children. Then this, this monster thinks I'm a child, too. So did Strimbello. They had sniffed a false identity, but they had assumed Rini was a child, sneaking through the club in adult guise. But if that was true, then Wicked and his cronies had delivered her to the process that had crippled Stephen and God knew how many others. Kabu was still on his knees, staring helplessly. He, too, was caught. Perhaps he had been caught before she ever found him, and was now as far gone as Stephen. He could not exit. But Rini could, or at least she had been able to a few minutes before. For a moment she stopped struggling against the invisible restraint. Sensing surrender, the dark shape of Kali expanded, looming now so that it filled her vision. The veiled face tilted forward, cloak billowing around it like a cobra's hood. The lights flashed. Words of warning, commands, threats, all cascaded over Rini, running together into a ragged drone so loud that it seemed to make her earplugs vibrate. Exit! Nothing happened. Her sim remained frozen, an unwilling worshipper at Kali's feet. But that made no sense. She had spoken the code word. Her system was set for voice commands. There was no reason it shouldn't work. 
She stared into a vortex of swirling red light, trying to hold concentration through the shattering, never-ending noise, struggling to block out the panic and think. Any voice command should trigger her system back at the poly, unless these people could somehow jam her voice in the same way they had frozen her sim. But if they could do that, why go to all the trouble to bring her to this particular place when Strimbello could just have immobilized her in the yellow room? Why put on such an elaborate show? They must need her here, isolated, exposed to this barrage of light and sound. It had to be hypnosis, some method using high-speed strobing and special sonics that operated right at the nervous system level, something that cut in between her higher thought process, processes and her physical responses, which might mean that she hadn't spoken at all, but only thought she had. "'Exit!' she screamed. Still, nothing happened. It was hard to concentrate, hard to feel her real body beneath the blinding, jaggedly pulsating light and the painful hum of a million wasps in her ears. She could feel her attacker ripping away at her shell of concentration, the only thing protecting her from a tumble down into nothingness. She could not keep it up much longer. Dead man's switch. The words fluttered up, a few scraps of memory shaken loose by the maelstrom. Every system has a dead man's switch. Something to release you if you get into serious trouble. A stroke or something. The poly must have one. It was so loud, so excruciatingly loud. Each thought felt as slippery as an untanked goldfish. Heart rate. Is the switch hooked into the EKG monitor in the harness. She would have to assume it was. It was the only chance she had. She would have to try to drive her pulse rate up beyond permitted danger levels. Rainey let the fear she had been struggling to check finally burst free. It was not difficult. Even if she had guessed correctly, there was only a very thin chance of this plan working. More likely she would fail and find herself sliding down a long tunnel into blackness, as Stephen had done before her, a blackness indistinguishable from death. She could not feel her physical body, which was no doubt hanging uselessly beside Kabu's in the harness room. She was only eyes and ears, battered to the edge of madness by the howling whirlwind of light that was Kali. Unchecked and without outlet, desperation ran through her like some horrible, silent electrocution. But it was not enough. She needed more. She thought of her heart and imagined it pumping. Now, letting her sheer fright color the image, she visualized it pounding ever faster, struggling to cope with an emergency for which evolution could never have prepared. It's hopeless she told herself and pictured her heart shuddering, hurrying. I'll die here or fall down into madness forever. The dark muscle was a shy, secret thing, like an oyster ripped from its shell, struggling hopelessly to survive, pumping hard, straining, losing the beat for a moment as the rhythms bounced awkwardly against each other. Streaks of hot and cold went jagging through her, fear to the toxic level, shivers of helpless animal panic, Racing, fighting, failing. I'll be lost, just like Stephen, just like Kabu. Soon I'll be in the hospital, zipped into an oxygen-filled body bag. Dead, dead meat. Images began to flash before her eyes, leaping out of the kaleidoscopic display that filled her vision. Stephen, gray and unconscious, lost to her, wandering somewhere in an empty, lonely place. I'm dying. Her mother, shrieking in agony during her final moments, caught, <coughs> caught on the upper floor of the department store as the flames climbed hungrily upward, knowing she would never see her children again. I'm dying. Dying. Death, the destroyer, the great nothing, the freezing fist that seized you and squeezed you, 
crushed you into dust that floated in the blank dark between stars. Her heart stuttered, laboring toward failure like an overheated engine. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm... And that's where we're going to stop. Somewhat dramatic, perhaps, but seemed like a good place to stop. Um, and since it is now one minute after eight. So anyway, with that, I thank you so much for hanging in with me. I hope you enjoyed that section. There's a bit more of the Rini and Tabu uh, stuff. Um, so there's not really a good place to break beyond that. So that's where we're breaking. Sorry, it's a bit on the cliffhangery sense, but most of you know what happens anyway, probably. I'm guessing. I don't know for certain. Um, actually, it'd be interesting if any of you haven't read the other land books before that. It'd be um, entertaining to me if you dropped me a, a comment um, because I'm going on the assumption that most of you have read them, but perhaps not. But uh, anyway. So with that, I am going to thank you uh, very much for joining me as always and um, especially for uh, sticking with me after I took uh, Christmas weekend off. Um, but I'm glad to be back and together we will whip this new year into shape and uh, to help further that cause all of you take good care of yourselves take good care of your loved ones your friends your neighbors uh, anybody that you know as I said it is the cold season it is extremely cold right now out there in most parts of the world but especially obviously in the northern hemisphere so if you are able to um, get a donation together of warm socks or warm anything, t-shirts, underwear, things like that. Take it down to your local homeless shelter um, or find some place that takes, picks up donations or drop it off somewhere um, because there are a lot of people who aren't as fortunate as us who are going to be suffering in this season. And with that, I will take my leave and bid you adieu. And I will see you next Sunday, first at 1 a.m. and then in this time slot at 7 p.m. And... Yeah, that's it. So have a good night. Happy 2022 and be good to yourselves and others. I'll see you real soon. Bye.